Variance is one way to express how well the average value tends to describe the location of all the observations in our data set. Or put another way, variance is one way to tell us how much our data is dispersed, spread around, or spread closely to the mean or average. For example, in the US, the percentage of adults who like Italian cuisine is estimated to be about 93%. This is a very low variant situation since most people in the US apparently are bunched around agreeing that this is a cuisine they like. On the other hand, only 49% of adults report that they like British cuisine. This is an example of a relatively high variance question due to the polarization. Quite a few people seem to like it and in almost equal proportion seem to not. As another visual example of what variance is, let's imagine two comic book stores each asking a customer satisfaction question. Bart's Comics is on the left and Albert's Comics is on the right. Notice how the average customer satisfaction score is nearly the same for both Bart's Comics and Albert's Comics. However, the dispersion of the data is not equal. Bart's Comics responses range in a much more dispersed fashion away from the average. There's a higher proportion of individuals who are both strongly satisfied and a large proportion of individuals who are not satisfied. On the other hand, for Albert's comics, with a similar average level of satisfaction, nonetheless has a different level of dispersion. Answers tended to be bunched towards the mean, where there are relatively few amount of people who are not very satisfied or individuals who are strongly satisfied. More concretely, the way we calculate variance depends on whether we're dealing with a percentage variable, so-called dichotomous variable, where everything's coded into an either or category, zero or one, or we're dealing with a continuous variable, something that was measured on an interval or ratio level scale. Let's illustrate how both of these calculations work in practice. Let's imagine the following survey question and 10 responses to that survey question. Do you intend to buy an Oculus Rift in the next six months? And people were only able to answer one of two ways, yes or no. Ones were coded as yes and zero were coded as no. The way we calculate the variance for a dichotomous variable is simply P times Q, where P is the percentage of yeses and Q is the percentage of nos or whatever the two categories are. And 0.6 times 0.4 results in 0.24. That's all it takes to calculate variance for a two option variable. For a continuous variable example, Let's imagine a Likert scale going from one to five, so an agreement scale, and the question is, I think VR video games will be fun to play. We see the equation in the bottom, bottom there to calculate variance. You may recall that from your introductory uh, statistics textbook. How that works is we collect 10 responses, or whatever our sample is. Individuals, of course, are coded one to five, and the simple average is three. The equation down here then says we have to take, for each individual observation, we have to subtract the average. So we do that. We subtract three from each one of the scores. Then we have to square each one of the scores according to the equation. And then the summation sign says simply sum them all up and then divide it by n minus one where n is the sample size. 20 divided by 10 minus one equals 2.22. Fortunately for us in this class, we don't calculate variance by hand very often. We rely on Excel or statistical software to do that for us. Now keep in mind, we're talking about variance right now in the context of trying to determine the optimal sample size. And that reveals something that I'm tempted to call the variance paradox, which, which also might be the name for my experimental jazz band if I ever form one. What I mean here is it seems paradoxical that we need the variance in the population to estimate our required sample size. If we need the variance in the population, a statistical value, in order to calculate the optimal sample size for our study, how in the world do we actually get that estimate before we even collect the data? Remember, we don't have data yet. We're trying to figure out how much of it to collect. So how do we resolve this contradiction? We need something that we may not have right in front of us because we haven't collected data. Well, there's three typical solutions. First, we can rely on estimates that are already published in secondary research of variance, or we can use rules of thumb that have a reasonable track record of success in terms of estimating variance. Finally, we could always conduct a small pretest from our study, collecting say 20 to 40 responses. From there, collect the data, then calculate an estimate of the variance based on this small pretest sample. And then based on that calculation, we then complete the total sample size equation and figure out how many respondents we, we need in total. Let's show an example of where we use secondary research to help us estimate the variance in our population. 
Let's imagine that we're trying to do a study that estimates the percentage of vegetarians in California. We might use the 2016 study from the Pew Research Center as a starting point. According to them, about 9% of all U.S. adults reported they're strictly or mostly vegan or vegetarian. Or we might use something from the Simmons Local Report 2017 that showed in specifically California, a little over 11% of individuals agreed a little or a lot that they're vegetarian. From here, starting with these percentages of 9 and 11%, we might make some safety adjustments based on some reasonable assumptions. Perhaps we think, for example, that vegetarian is more likely to be increasing in prevalence. Or we think there's a shift towards even more healthy lifestyles in California other places. So we would start with these estimates we find in secondary research and then bump those numbers up as sort of a safety valve when we calculate our sample size. So perhaps we hear in this case to play it safe, we might start off by saying the variance estimate settles at 20% vegetarian, 80% not. Of course, we're actually going to do the study eventually to test this. And if we plug in these estimated values of 0.2 times 0.8, we come to a variance estimate of 0.16, which we could then plug into our equation to determine the optimal sample size. This will result in a smaller required sample size if we had just assumed a 50-50 split instead. For a continuous example, let's imagine that we want to measure the level of green satisfaction our customers have towards our environmental initiatives. In a research study by Chen in 2010, they actually measured and conceptualized something called green satisfaction. They defined it as the degree of a customer's pleasurable level of consumption-related fulfillment to satisfy a customer's environmental desires, sustainable expectations, and green needs. In that study, there was a summary table. The summary table reported the average value for the green satisfaction scale as well as a standard deviation. And of course, if you simply square the standard deviation, you arrive at the variance estimate. We could use this variance estimate for our own study, assuming, of course, we use the exact same wording for green satisfaction that was used in the Chen scale. Now, for rules of thumb to derive variance estimates, the simplest one for a dichotomous variable is simply the 50-50 approach. In other words, if we have nothing else to go off of, we simply assume that for the variable we're interested in calculating a percentage of, we just assume that the variance in the population is a 50-50 split. This is playing it totally safe. At worst, we'll collect more data than we require if it turns out that in reality, the percentage is not 50-50 and it's something with less variance. For continuous variables, and importantly, continuous variables that have a bounded range, meaning we know the minimum and we know the maximum value, we simply take the range and divide by four. While well, marketing research, we often have bounded continuous variables because we use measurement scales. For example, look at this seven point experience evaluation scale below. This has a six point range. So from one to seven means there's a range of six. If we follow the rule of range divided by four, we take six divided by four, and that arrives at our standard deviation approximation. And of course, if we simply square that, we get to a variance estimate of 2.25. I've seen other texts that suggest things like take the range and divide by six, but to my knowledge, the take the range and divide by four is the most prevalent rule of thumb. 